Hello, everybody. Um, well, it's good to see you here. I'm the only thing before your lunch, you know, so I'm, I hope this is gonna be enjoyable. And it's gonna be very hands-on as well. So we're gonna fire up the terminal at one point and see everything in action. Observability in Kubernetes with Kong. As we build our systems, it is impossible to run a modern architecture with no observability in place. Perhaps it's even irresponsible. As we are decoupling our systems into microservices, we're going to be having lots of moving parts that we want to observe in order to determine problems, determine latency, and understanding what we can improve moving forward. Observability is also one of those functions that we don't want to build over and over again for every new application or every new service that our teams create. We want to get that out of the box. And this is what this talk is about. We're going to be learning how to use and leverage Kong to get observability out of the box, in this case, in Kubernetes. How many of you are familiar with Kong? My name is uh, Marco Palladino. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Kong. And Kong, of course, it's an open source project. Uh, there are more than almost a million running nodes of Kong in the world. It's a very popular platform for APIs and microservices. And you can download it for free on GitHub if you go on Kong slash Kong, of course. Um, and it is both an API gateway and a service mesh. These are common use cases within pretty much every organization and every platform. We're going to be having north-south traffic coming inside our Kubernetes cluster or coming inside our data center that we want to protect, we want to enable, and we're going to be having service-to-service -service communication in an east-west capacity, also known as a service mesh, very common in uh, microservice-oriented architectures, and even in that use case, we want to be able to get some functions out of the box. In a typical reference architecture, we're going to be having east-west traffic within our cluster, within our uh, Kubernetes cluster or data center, so services talking to other services directly, and we're going to be having external clients, but those could be, for example, external teams that want to access those services. So with Kong, Kong is a runtime that can be deployed in a north-south capacity and can be deployed as a sidecar on an east-west capacity, which means that we can auto-inject a Kong sidecar alongside each one of these different services in order to implement features like observability, but also mutual TLS, service segmentation, out of the box without having to change our applications. And that's the whole point of Kong. As we build our software, we want to be focusing on the business value that our software, our services, our APIs should be delivering. And we want to take away the extra work of implementing that mutual TLS, that encryption, that full life cycle, if you wish, for APIs and services from those teams working on, on our applications. So the idea is to outsource those concerns to something like Kong so that the teams can focus on the service and not on those complementary features that we do need before going in production. Different use cases. So for, uh, of course, for North-South, uh, traditionally pay gateway, um, it's a consumer-centric use case. Um, we're managing requests that are coming outside of the data center, that can be outside of the Kubernetes cluster, that can be from a mobile application that, um, you know, an iPhone app, for example, that runs somewhere. Though those can also be other teams within the organizations, or perhaps those could be requests coming from other Kubernetes cluster in other clouds or other data centers, as well as partners and so on. So when it comes to the API gateway, we want to have something that enables the lifecycle, the enablement um, of that consumption 
to those external teams, to those external partners by implementing onboarding procedures, by securing the traffic in a very specific way, by protecting it, for example, with technologies like web application firewall that are not very viable when it comes to east-west traffic. They're not viable because in east-west traffic, we are focusing more on the services that we're running within our architecture less on the concept of users onboarding, less on, of the concept, on, the, on the concept of um, clients that are going to be sending pretty much anything at it uh, because it's a more controlled environment. With that said, uh, in East-West, we also have some of those concerns. We want to implement mutual TLS. We want to pro pro implement observability. We want to segment what services can consume other services. And so that's where the service mesh use case comes handy because we can implement all of that in this sidecar proxy that effectively becomes the contact point for each request from one service to another service. The services are, not, are never connecting to each other directly but are going to be talking to this sidecar proxy that transparently without changing any line of code on the actual service will be able to implement those features. And when it comes to services, it's not just an API. It's not just a gRPC server, for example. But it can be really anything. It can be a database. It can be a Kafka queue. It can be Redis. It can be anything that runs on a network that we want to consume. In a way, I would say that service mesh is more oriented towards implementing advanced networking features even more so than, a, than, a, than an API gateway and an API management platform. So these are the two different use cases. And today, uh, I'm going to be focusing on the first one, on the API gateway. So we're going to be having our services running in our Kubernetes cluster. How do we get that observability out of the box? But as you can imagine, getting that out of a service mesh is equally as simple. Kong, it's a community-driven product. Uh, there is more than 150 co core contributors that are contributing to the product. There are more than 40,000 community members. Um, the adoption has been pretty great since, since day one. Kong comes from another company. Uh, before being the CTO and co-founder of Kong, I started a company called Mashape. And Mashape was the largest API marketplace uh, back then in, 2000, uh, in 2015, 2014. We had uh, over 300,000 developers consuming APIs over the marketplace. The marketplace, think of, it, think of it as an eBay, right? You could search for APIs, providers could offer their APIs, and we would provide this monetization system on top of all of these APIs, security, observability, monetization, on top of everything. In 2015, you know, we've been running the marketplace for a while, and although the user adoption was growing and was great, you know, we were a VC-backed company back then, and we had to generate much more revenue than we were generating. And so in 2015, we decided to take the most valuable thing we've built, which was the Kong Gateway, that was powering all of these APIs, and then open source it. And so this is how Kong be, was born in 2015. Um, Kong as King Kong, uh, because Mashape had an ape, ape logo uh, back then. So we took Kong, we open sourced it in 2015, and since then, the adoption, the community has been great. It's a community-driven project. Uh, it's on GitHub, runs anywhere. Uh, one of the most important things we have took in consideration with Kong was the fact that organizations and developers and teams are going to be running on all sorts, all sorts of platforms. And although tra transitioning to Kubernetes is, is a journey, that many teams are, are doing today, the pragmat pragmatism of the situation is that there's going to be lots of workloads running on virtual machines that are not going to move to Kubernetes anytime soon and perhaps never. So when we talk about Kong, Kong was born after Kubernetes was out in 2014, after Docker was out in 2013. So we built something that was platform agnostic. You can run it natively on Kubernetes, by and configuring it with Kubernetes CRDs if you want to do so. But at the same time, you can run this on pretty much any other platform. And so by doing that, we want to ease that transition, that journey into microservices, into Kubernetes. 
and, and, and the problem that Kong has been solving over time really became uh, evident after uh, those two technologies, Docker, Kubernetes, came out around 2013 and 2014. Um, microservices happen to be the, is the software answer to more complex demand within our applications. You know, in order to scale the business, organizations are reconsidering what, what's the architecture that's going to bring them there, and microservices happens to be the answer for some of those business concerns. Think of Netflix, think of Amazon. And so as organizations are driving that business by implementing architectures which allows them to either improve business scalability or team productivity, they adopted more decoupled and distributed architectures, which in a way compounded the problems of security observability over time within the organization. Because we're moving away from having a handful of services and a handful of APIs into having hundreds, thousands of those services. And so the way we think about observability, the way we think about security, the way we think about encryption, the way we, we, we think about authentication, authorization, logging, all of the above becomes exponentially higher the more decoupled these systems become. And in a way, we require that. In, uh, you know, in, a, in a monolithic application, we might find problems by debugging the Java virtual machine, right? But in a microservice or enter architecture, we want to be being able to capture those, those traces, those metrics, those logs, in such a way that allows us to understand where the problem is. And so in this journey from monolith to services to microservices to perhaps even serverless and function as a service, we've been trying to help those teams with Kong getting those functions out of the box. Right? So we, we want to be really an enabler and a, a partner into that technology transformation that's happening nowadays. Kong has been built with uh, a few things in mind. One I've already mentioned, being platform agnostic, that was very important for Kong and still is, as well as creating an extensible system that can uh, be providing these policies via what we call plugins. So plugins are, uh, plugins is basically our extensibility framework. You can build the security plugins, you can build monitoring observability plugins, you can build the rate limiting plugins. Some of them, of course, we already have. Uh, on top of Kong. In fact, the community has built more than 500 plugins that you can use today for pretty much um, you know, the most common use cases. And also, you can build your own private plugins if you end up, and you will end up, in a specific edge use case that's very specific to your organization and requires you to build on top of Kong to, for example, support uh, a legacy authentication system or a legacy throttling system and so on. So plugins are really the core of Kong. Kong, without plugins, is a reverse proxy with a plugin run loop. All the actual functionality is being delivered by those plugins. And plugins can be security plugins, authentication plugins. In fact, there is a hub of plugins that are, uh, you know, are available on top of Kong that can be adopted and used in one click, really. Some are built by the core team for Kong. Some are built by the community. And some are, some are private. You don't have to publish them if you don't want to. And they're built by our users. So very specific to their environments. Like I mentioned, Kong was born in 2015 from MassShape. Um, that's a little bit uh, outdated. We're now over 100 million downloads. And it's being used in production by um, we, we do run with, in the community, of course, but we do also work with enterprise organizations. And so we're trying to, uh, you know, Kong is helping with mission critical workloads uh, in these enterprise organizations. And, you know, it's all over the place. Every company is a technology company. And if they are a technology company, they have APIs and services running within their systems. And so if they have services and APIs running in their systems, they have to protect them, secure them, monitor them, enable them, offer them to other teams. And so they're using Kong for this full life cycle. Kong was built on top of our flavor of Nginx. Um, the networking runtime that's receiving the incoming requests and then proxying those requests outside of Kong, it's effectively Nginx. But it's not vanilla Nginx. 
we are Nginx contributors, and we have extended Nginx to support a few things that Nginx didn't support. Uh, in particular, uh, we are running on top of a framework called Open Resty, which allows to hook into the life cycle of every request and response within Nginx by uh, writing Lua code, L-U-A, which is a very extremely performant and fast language that runs on top of a virtual machine of a, on a Lua implementation um, of the virtual machine that's written in C, and that's called the LuaJIT. And the LuaJIT is phenomenal. It's one of the fastest uh, C implementations of a virtual machine you can find in the world. In fact, Lua and LuaJIT were invented for embedded platforms. You know, every time you're running in a restricted environment, you're running on embedded devices with no memory, with performance constraints, Lua and LuaJIT, and in fact, if you, are, if you ever worked into the mobile industry, Lua and LuaJIT are very popular within that specific mobile use case, in games, for example, to extend what those games can do. And the reason why they're, it's popular is because it's, it's lightweight and performant and fast, very fast. And so we took that technology and we've built Kong with it, which coincidentally happens to be the same stack, technology stack, that Cloudflare, if you're familiar with them, uh, the Akamai competitor, uh, they're also running. So this stack, Lua LuaJIT, on top of uh, Nginx, it's in fact processing 15% of the world traffic, global internet traffic. But a few people know that. Extremely fast, built in, in, uh, in C and Lua. And with, with this stack and this runtime, we've built a gateway that's easy to use. Very simple to use, to get started with, without sacrificing more advanced features if you want to go in there and tune the machine. LuaJIT in particular needs a special mention. It was created by Mike Paul. Um, this guy did, uh, did an amazing job into creating something that, that it's, it's a, basically it's a, it's a piece of art, really, uh, the LuaJIT. It's extremely performant and fast and efficient. So Kong was released in 2015. Since then, we had more than 55 releases, public releases, more than a million nodes running per month in the world, um, large, a large community. Um, we did actually release the latest and greatest yesterday, 1.3.0, uh, which implements, among other things, uh, a few features, including uh, native L7 gRPC support for uh, both ingress and egress. Uh, we have added an enhanced upstream mutual TLS authentication, and much more. So we were now, the, the company itself is headquartered in San Francisco, but we're a global company. So we are uh, also um, you know, engaging with contributors and developers all over the world, and we encourage them to contribute and help us making this a great, great open source project. So this was released yesterday, by the way. And uh, as well with Kong 1.3, we also, Kong can be deployed in many platforms, right? So we can deploy Kong on bare metal if we want to. We can deploy Kong on Kubernetes. And for that, we have released a new version of the Kubernetes Ingress Controller, which we're going to be seeing today. But you can deploy, we have people running these on Raspberry Pis, right, on, on the actual device. So you can really run Kong anywhere. It's very lightweight. Today, we're going to be focusing on the Kubernetes Ingress Controller, of course. I've got my mini cube running in the background. So we're going to be firing up the terminal and see how to use Kong to protect a few microservices. The Kubernetes Ingress Controller is, of course, also open source and treats Kong as a first-class citizen within the Kubernetes cluster. Kong offers an admin API. It's a RESTful API. Think of Elasticsearch, very similar to that, that you can use to configure the system. We also support a declarative configuration written in, um, in YAML, but it's our declarative config. But when it comes to Kubernetes, we support Kubernetes CRDs, right? You don't want to use admin APIs. You don't want to use our own declarative config. You want to be changing the state of the Kong uh, cluster by effectively doing things the Kubernetes way. So the Kubernetes Ingress Controller supports those CRDs and automatically listens to the Kubernetes API server to detect what are the services in the APIs you're adding over time. And depending on how you're configuring the system, Kong can add those services and those APIs automatically 
into, into our um, data model so that you can enable that observability or security or all of those plugins out of the box. So there are more than 500 features you can apply on top of Kong, by the way. Like open ID connect, rate limiting, throttling, logging, uh, bot detection, you know, transformations, and so on. The Ingress controller itself uh, has been out, around for a while, and uh, it, we recommend using this. You shouldn't be using Kong 0.13. You should be using perhaps 1.x, but you, know, you can go back as back as 0.13 if you use this. So before I switch my tabs and I go on the terminal to see this running, uh, I would like to explain a few concepts for Kong. When using Kong, Kong itself has a few core entities that we need to understand what they do. Uh, some of them are services, routes, upstreams, and plugins. You know, the service, it's an abstraction of one of our upstream services. So basically, this can be an API that we're running within our systems. It can be a pod, right? It can be something that runs in uh, Kubernetes. We do have a route which determines the ingress route, ingress route for routing these requests to an upstream. So the route, it's the ingress rule, if you wish, is what the user, the consumer, will have to use in order to enter the cluster. And the upstream is the egress from Kong to the actual API running within Kubernetes. And then, of course, there are plugins. So once we have our services configured, and the services can be, config, can be consumed by using this route that goes to this specific upstream, then on top of that flow, we can apply plugins. So we can say, OK, great. We have this API that's available on slash API, for example. Slash API would be the route. And now on top of that flow, I want to secure it. I want to protect it. I want to add as many plugins as I want to enhance what we're going to be doing with those requests. This, of course, happens on the Kong runtime in a uh, most likely sub-millisecond performance latency. Um, depending on the plugin, of course, there might be less or more computation. And it happens without having to change our APIs and our applications. So the teams, they build their systems the way they do today. They push them, there, they push them in their Kubernetes cluster. And then these features can be configured on top of Kong without requiring the involvement of those teams at all. So for example, the central platform team can enforce consolidation on how security is being handled, observability is being handled across the board without having to involve the actual teams. Um, yeah, so uh, the route is the ingress. Those uh, routes will point to a service. The service, it's an abstraction that in a way contains a bunch of upstreams. The upstream can be different versions for our APIs. Um, if this is a billing API, so the service will be billing, the upstream is going to be v1, v2, v3. And each upstream has a target, and the target is the actual pod, the actual instance we're going to be targeting when making the request. So these are ju this is just a, a quick intro to the data model that Kong enforces. This is valid on Kubernetes, but also anywhere else. And once we have that configured, and we're going to be running it very quick, very soon, we can then, for example, add new rate limiting on top of this Kong cluster. So we can create a new CRD, a Kong plugin CRD that, for example, adds a rate limiting such as we rate limit by IP address. Uh, we only allow one request per second, 19 per hour. This is not a very significant, uh, you know, in production we probably want something else, right? So, but basically it shows how simple it is to configure a plugin on top of Kong running on Kubernetes via a CRD. As well as the rules. So it's very simple to determine what rules we want to implement uh, by, by using the ingress that Kong provides. So this is very Kubernetes friendly. I'm going to be running a demo now. I, I believe that seeing it in action, it's worth a million words. So whatever I'm running today can also be replicated by you uh, at home or in the office by following that link. That link will point to a GitHub gist that shows you all the steps I'm going to be running. You just copy and paste the commands and run it on your own, and you will be able to replicate this demo. 
in fact, let me now uh, switch my tabs. So I do have, I do have um, Minikube running on my system. In fact, we can uh, list the namespaces. And there is a Kong namespace. So I've started a Kong namespace, which includes the, um, the Kong uh, ingress controller. All of this can be initiated by yourself. So this is the case I was talking about, by basically using our official Helm chart. So you run your Helm chart, and this will install Kong and the ingress on your Kubernetes cluster. One command, and you install it. I ran this before coming in here, just because I wasn't sure the connection would be good. So um, now that it's running, we can also, for example, uh, by the way, we can also, if you're familiar with Minikube, uh, we can start the dashboard. You can see our workloads running on, uh, on the GUI. OK, so now that we have Kong running, we want to do a couple of things. There is no other service or system running within this Kubernetes cluster but Kong. So what we want to do is to add some APIs, some services, uh, that will be our, basically represent our APIs that we want to observe. We're going to be adding the APIs and then we're going to be using the Prometheus plugin that Kong offers out of the box to get that observability automatically into that uh, Grafana system without, um, without in, one, in one click, basically. So um, I want to expose, Kong listens on two different ports. One is the admin API port that we are not going to be using in Kubernetes because we want to use the CRDs to configure the system. And then the other port is what we call the proxy port. So that's the port that the consumers will have to use if they want to enter the Kubernetes cluster via the ingress. So what I'm going to be doing now is running a simple command that basically uh, exposes, uh, it forwards requests uh, on uh, port 8000 of my Kong controller. So if I run this on my computer, we should be seeing a response from Kong. Yeah, so we made a request, and this request goes nowhere because we have no services configured into Kong, and Kong is complaining, hey, you're trying to consume something that I can't find. And it's fine, because the cluster is empty up until now. So in, in fact, we can also use we can also use our browser. So I do have prepared uh, in this uh, simple YAML file that starts a few services. Let me actually do this. So this starts a few services that are, we're going to be using to simulate APIs running in the Kubernetes cluster. We have a billing service, we have an invoice service, and we have comments, right? So these are simple services that are going to be echoing back the requests we're making. They're mock, mock APIs, if you wish. In production, this will be your actual APIs and your actual services. So I'm going to be executing this. Uh, I'm going to be creating this YAML, these, uh, these services within my Minikube by basically applying that YAML file. Simple as that. And Kubernetes Create, is creating now the services. So in fact, if we go fetch our pods again, we're seeing that this is being created. Now, depending on how, fa oops, depending on how fast or slow the connection is, it's now pulling the container from the internet and then starting the service. While this is working, I, would, I also want to show you the hub that determines the features we can apply on, uh, on top of Kong. So if you go on the website, we click, we click plugins. We can see all the plugins, uh, some of the plugins that Kong offers out of the box. You can fetch them from here. And each plugin has a unique name. So you can apply the plugin by using the plugin Kong plugin CRD type to, for example, implement proxy caching or implement response rate limiting or uh, supporting Prometheus, which is what we're going to be using today. And when it comes to Prometheus, basically the, by using the admin API, we create a new plugin that applies to this service, 
with name Prometheus, and then we can configure it. This is a very small container, which makes me very concerned from the other ones I have to pull. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So the, as we wait for this to happen, what I'm going to be doing once we have these services running is effectively creating the ingress rules that allow us to consume the service. So we're going to be creating a slash billing. Slash, we have three services, the billing, the comments, and the invoice service that we're going to be creating with uh, this YAML, which is running. And then on top of that, we're going to be creating the ingress rules so that when we receive a request on slash billing on the Kong port, Kong understands that really we want to proxy this to the billing service we're running. Likewise for comments and invoices. So when we play this CRD, Kong will listen to the Kubernetes API server and it will automatically update the, the Kong data model to support the services. Okay, so it's running now. All uh, right, so, okay, we got the service running, so let's go ahead. So this strips the path uh, for the routing, so basically we, um, it, it's a rule that allow, basically we're, we're going to be stripping out the final slash from the original request, uh, which I need in this case, you might not need in other use cases, but this is the, the, the fun part. So this will create those mappings inside of Kong. So today, right now, if I do, uh, if I can try to consume Kong on the on port 8000 slash billing, it won't find anything because the system is not being configured yet. But if I do apply, if I do apply this configuration, it will create the mapping. So I should be making that request one more time, and that and this time it should work. So this has created the ingresses. We can also, by the way, explore that from, from, you know, from the actual GUI. And then if I make that request again, okay, this is the billing service. So this is the actual service responding with something. I want to simulate a bunch of requests to these services because I want to simulate some traffic. This is a very inefficient way of doing it. I'm creating a while through loop and making a few requests to, those, to, to the services. So I'm going to be opening up a new tab and just and just execute that. There you go. Bunch of requests right now. So today, uh, in this situation, we're not seeing anything. So we have an APIs in our system. We configure them. People are making requests to our APIs, but we have no observability whatsoever. The whole point here is that now we want out of the box to get that observability. So I'm going to be using Prometheus and, um, and Grafana to be doing that. So we're going to be pushing this information. Prometheus is going to be fetching this information from Kong, and then using Grafana, it's a very nice GUI, we can visualize those charts. Now, I'm a little bit concerned right now because this, um, because um, the connection that didn't seem to be very fast. So let me try and see what's up, what happens if we install Prometheus and how long it's gonna take. 
Okay. So we're going to be installing this into a monitoring namespace so that we know that all our monitoring stuff, it's in here. Okay. Um, it's running. And then we're going to also be installing Grafana so that we can visualize in a nice, nice dashboard our metrics. Cool. Okay, we have some stuff running, and these ones are still being pulled. How many of you are familiar with Prometheus and Grafana? Yeah. So there is another, that's very good by the way. Uh, there is another, so depending on the internet connection, uh, you know, part of the demo also includes uh, demonstrating Zipkin. Uh, I really like, so Jaeger, has a Zipkin compati compatible server, so we can send Zipkin compatible traces to Jaeger as well and have them visualize in a, in a nice UI, in a nice GUI. So I might want to, as I demonstrate Prometheus and Grafana, I might want to install these as well so that we don't have to wait later. So basically here, uh, I'm installing Jaeger in the same namespace monitoring. So let's just do that. OK. So now there is much more stuff. So we're just waiting for Grafana at this point. And then once Grafana is running, we can start with Prometheus. Um, we, can start by, we can start installing Prometheus and visualizing the, um, we can start installing the plugin for Prometheus and visualize those charts into Grafana. So I mentioned about the Prometheus plugin. It's very simple. So if we go back to the hub, to enable the plugin, every plugin has a unique name. The name for this plugin is, of course, Prometheus. And every plugin can have its own configuration. This is a very simple plugin, which means that if we pass the, the name only, by default, this will, this will work. So to create the plugin, I'm going to create a new CRD, which is Kong plugin. It's a Kong plugin type. We're going to make this plugin global. You can apply plugins per a specific service or for every service or for a specific consumer. So there are different ways you can select where, what's the path that the plugin should run. So in this case, we're making it global, which means that every service within Kong that has been configured, and in this case, the three services we have, the invoice, billing, and comment service, Will be, um, uh, will be targeted by this configuration. Oh, sorry. There you Okay, uh, error when retrieving, I see. I 
I think I'm overloading my mini cube a little bit. Oh, I see. Okay. So we, I have just applied this configuration. I had um, some syntax errors in it. So I have created this CRD, com plugin, global, and the plugin we're installing is Prometheus. Let me see if Grafana started in the meanwhile. I can hear my computer getting a little bit crazy here. So let me see. It's a little bit overloaded. We're running a few pods now. We're running Prometheus, Grafana, Kong, three APIs, Jaeger. So there is a lot going on. You would think a $2,000 computer would be able to handle this. Okay, so a few hiccups, but let me see if Grafana is now running. Okay, so everything is running right now. So it did it. Um, cool. So what we want to do is to expose Prometheus and Grafana. So I'm going to be doing this, uh, and, and then I'm going to expose the, the uh, Grafana app as well. Cool. So now, uh, this is going to be exposed on port 3000. If I go on 3000, I should have Grafana running. OK. So basically, this is the Grafana that's running within the Kubernetes cluster. We did a port forwarding. And now uh, we need the credential. To fetch the credential, we're going to create a Kubernetes secret. And this is the password. Within Grafana, there is going to be a Kong dashboard that we can access. And this is the official Kong dashboard in Grafana. It's very unfortunate that this is not running the way it should be. But um, you have the steps. These will provide lots of charts that shows you exactly what are all the requests, the latency that are being running through the Kubernetes cluster right now out of the box. Right. So the hiccups we had today is depending on the actual uh, load and internet connection um, on my computer. So um, that's unfortunate. It seems like Grafana is not loading for whatever reason. It did, and then it stopped. But by executing that plugin, we're going to be getting all those uh, charts out of the box. So there we go. Maybe, maybe now we can get it real quick before they kick me out. Uh, there we go, Kong. OK. And 
and it's not working. Uh, but that's a dashboard. So I'm so sorry about this. Um, you can execute the demo by following those instructions. Of course, everything I showed today is available online on our official docs. Kong Nation, it's our discuss.kongichu.com. It's our um, forum for the community if you have questions, as well as GitHub or Twitter, of course. Um, download Kong 1.3 has been released yesterday, and thank you so much. 